So today I am benchmarking not just the much desired 3080 Ti, but also it's fully enabled Big Brother A6000. This 10,752 CUDA core card comes with 48 gigabytes of standard 16 gigabit per second GDR6 instead of the GDR6X that is in the 3080 Ti. Now, right out of the gate, let me tell you that this will not be a full professional level review for professional apps for the A6000. There's plenty of websites that have done that go to them. What I aim to do is use it as a comparison point for cards, GA102 cards, with GDR6 versus GDR6X, how much of the extra power consumption of the flagship Ampere cards is just this new memory type, and also just, I don't know, I do feel like, well, if you're a professional, you would go to these other professional reviewer websites for the A6000. I have to point out that almost none of them did gaming benchmarks, and I'm going to be honest with you guys. The person who sent this to me, games. And everyone I've talked to who has an A-series card, games. The amount of professionals that render and don't game on their PC is like almost 0%. So I'm going to try to give you an idea just to confirm, is this about the same performance as the 3080 Ti, despite supposedly having a 50-watt lower TDP and having a blower cooler? Well, we'll answer that question in a few minutes, but let me say this right out of the gate. Speaking of blower cooler... This is the most premium cooler I've felt in my life, despite being a blower. It has an intake, as I exclusively leaked, actually, from both sides. And it is quiet. It's quiet the whole time. Um, even if I were to manually set it to 100% load, which it never goes to with the default settings, it was quieter than Vega 64 at 100% load. No, it's not as quiet as a, you know one of these types of coolers, but it isn't that much louder. It is... By all accounts, the most premium card I've ever held. You'd think it would be. It's five grand. But, like, seriously, like, zero. Zero flex in any component. This is, don't worry, I'm not going to break it. This is really high-end. This is a very high-end card. And it also comes with an interesting high-end connector, an 8-pin CPU connector, so you can provide 300 watts with one connector. I actually find that a bit odd. I don't know, because they have to bundle an adapter anyways to dual 8 pins. I don't know why they didn't just use a 12 pin uh, for it if they're going to not use the standard connectors anyways. But I digress. It has an interesting connector as well that requires an adapter, just like the 3080 Ti. But that's all I'm going to say right out of the gate about these graphics cards. I do want to get straight to the quantitative benchmarks, as I call them, for them, because, well... They're not going to be as detailed as hardware unboxed as I always cover. You know, I don't have the resources to benchmark 35 cards. And honestly, I'll never do it as well, even if I did. And in fact, in this one, I'm not even going to go through every single game that I benchmarked step by step. I benchmarked Metro Exodus, Far Cry 5, Strange Brigade. Now, I think just telling you the overall performance quantitatively is the important thing. If you want more step by step stuff, I've done a lot of reviews in the past couple months for, for my channel. And so you can just check out kind of some of the more methodology behind that. But first of all, let's just do it. Let us get into the Division 2 in DirectX 12. This is still a very popular game, and I benchmarked it in 4K. And, yep, this is probably what a lot of people were expecting, right? You have the 3080 Ti Founders Edition overclocked, then the A6000 overclocked, then the 6800 XT Nitro Plus overclocked, 3080 Ti, and so on and so forth down there. You can clearly see multiple tiers emerging here. There is one tier of high-end cards, in my opinion, and it starts at the 6800 XT, or should I say enthusiast card. And then for the higher upper mid-range cards, it's just, you know, pretty much 2080 Ti through 3070. Although, again, and I'll get to this later, some other cards are not as far behind some of these cards in every game as people would have you believe. So, there. It's probably what you're expecting. 3080 Ti wins. Yay. Well, let's look at the other game that I want to zero in on. And that is Deus Ex Mankind Divided. This is just one example of a game that performed this way, and yeah, the 6800 XT wins. The starting at 650, supposedly, 6800 XT is beating the supposedly starting at $1,200 3080 Ti. Maybe not at stock settings, but there it's less than a 5% difference. No, I think this is very important to illustrate here that... When you look at these cards being benchmarked, they're not that far away, and sometimes the 6800 XT actually wins. And in fact, then, let's just go straight to the averages. Were you expecting this? 
That's right, the 6800 XT is about the same performance as the 3080 Ti after you overclock both. Um, and the A6000 is pretty close, you know, bookended by the unoverclocked 6800 XT. And all of these three cards, 6800 XT, A6000, 3080 Ti, are firmly above the 3070 and below. But anyways, the reason I felt like I needed to show those quantitative benchmarks right away is to... Hammer the point home that the 6800 XT, the A6000, the 3080 Ti, despite what some people portray, are all roughly the same performance. But one of those three cards has some serious downsides. Can you guess which one? Is it the RX 6800 XT with a 16 gigabyte buffer that starts at 650 and consumes 300 watts? Is it the A6000 that, while costing five grand, has an insane 48 gigabytes for creators and uses actually usually less than 300 watts in the tests I did? Or do you think it might be the supposedly 350 watt 3080 Ti with the same amount of VRAM as a fucking 3060 that costs twice as much almost as a 6800 XT? If you guessed option number three the 3080 ti that this is the one i have a problem one that's a bingo that's a bingo i need to stress this now now that we've established that this in real world use is no stronger than a 6800 xt in my opinion we need to stress that this uses 110 watts while idling and I found other people that chimed in from my Discord who said the same thing. In fact, the contact that sent me this 3080 Ti told me that he now leaves his PC off at night or it will heat up the room while idling. And you know what? I found similar things doing other stuff that pointed this being much more than a slightly higher power consumption card. When I used the A6000, the room didn't really heat up too much while gaming at night or working during a warmer day. With the 3080 Ti though, the room was always hot after using it for over an hour. And remember, I work during the day, so it might be warmer, but it's not at full load. But then during night, God, the room got toasty, even while gaming. And I have air conditioning up here. It overwhelmed it. This thing is insane. In fact, look at the menu screen here in Mountain Blade Bannerlord. During gaming, this thing conserves far less energy when not at 100% load. Here it's 60% load, still using more energy than a 6900 XT at screaming at full load. Uh, it really feels like it uses double the energy the 3070 and the A6000 use. And look, I did overclock it to be fair for my benchmarking, and I did get a consistent boost that made it generally, maybe by a hair, keep the performance crown over a 6800 XT, although probably not over a 6900 XT if I had one and overclocked it. But even with a tame overclock, this thing was pushing 400 watts. I refused to push it further, you know, and I don't think it's unfair. I am comparing it to the 24-7 overclock I did in Radian Wattman without spending too much time. It was a 24-7 stable overclock that made the 6800 XT run at 340 watts, and that's what I would have used day-to-day -day if I kept it. And day-to-day -day with this, 400 watts is at most what I would allow it to use day-to-day, -day, which is worth pointing out then, with that big 10 to 15% performance overclock, the 6800 XT was using less energy than this at stock. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. I see people say, oh, I got like a 3080 or a 3080 Ti, but then I undervolt it, so it's not a problem. Well, congrats. It's now weaker than that AMD card that's probably still using less energy at stock. So good job. And now let's get to the qualitative benchmarks. Did I feel the power of an NVIDIA Ti? Ti. Well, gaming in the real world, not just like quantitatively measuring numbers. Well, the first game I will bring up is Mount and Blade Bannerlord. And honestly, in Bannerlord, right out of the gate, I found the 3080 Ti to seemingly not perform as well as the 6800 XT at ultra settings in 4K. It seemed to be underperforming it in some areas by around 10% or more, as far as I could tell. And I kind of felt it. But... Mountain Blade Bannerlord did just add DLSS recently, and it doesn't have FSR yet. So, well, I tested it, and honestly, the conclusions I came to were a bit tricky. 
In Ultra Performance DLSS, I found it to be a bit of a joke. I mean, just look at this comparison here. It is obviously <laughs> like lower image quality and it had weird shimmering and glitches and like just wrong polygons on something. So I can't say that was good, but honestly in quality DLSS, I found it almost, I found it very hard to tell in most scenes, especially in the battles. The overworld still seemed a little blurrier and it felt to me like some of the armor just looked not as sharp in DLSS, but it kind of seemed worth it. But there were also some odd bugs and crashes that popped up that were definitely not there before when I didn't have DLSS on with the 3080 Ti or the 3070 or the A6000. And so I got to say that I give it to the 6800 XT in overall gaming experience versus the 3080 Ti. The room was cool, not overheating, and I was... You know, the, the DLSS in this game actually only really provides like a 20% boost in quality mode. And anything below quality mode looks like shit. So I would rather just have full native 4K with a 6800 XT than use DLSS with a 3080 Ti and sometimes have the game crash. But then let's move on to a game that I was impressed with DLSS on. Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition. At first, I actually decided to run... Full ray tracing in 4K, no VRSS, because it apparently can pixelate fires, and with 90% shading and, and no DLSS turned on. I really wanted to flex the tensor cores between these two cards and see if I could find a game where the A6000 pulled ahead. And, well, honestly, I found the 3080 Ti with these brutally demanding settings got around 45 to 50 frames per second some areas below 40 and overclocking got it to pretty consistently stay above 50 frames a second again some drops below it and well i don't know honestly though the a6000 that was about five percent weaker the extra tensor cores and shaders didn't make up for the fact that this is clocked higher and has a bit more bandwidth although i did overclock that one so the bandwidth difference wasn't that drastic um, and eventually though, I did turn DLSS quality on and well, it felt slightly blurrier sometimes. I got to say, this is the one game so far that DLSS has impressed me. The original Metro Exodus looked like crap with DLSS, but the enhanced edition, it works. And I didn't have any bugs, any freezes, any problems. DLSS quality mode brought a pretty big noticeable frame rate boost and it was practically visually unnoticeable. So I would definitely leave it on when I keep playing Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition. I think I will keep playing it now because this version works better than the previous version. Having said that, though, yeah, I tried it with the 3070. And when I'm not just trying to push the tensor cores super hard, I found that I could get it to settings that I was pretty happy with getting above 70 frames per second in 4K with DLSS on. So... I didn't feel like I needed this to enjoy the game as much. And this was probably the best case scenario for a game where you felt the extra performance while also feeling the extra 100 to 200 watts. In fact, let's now switch to Deep Rock Galactic to hit this point home. I can honestly say that yes, the 3080 Ti did run it better than the 3070 in this game in terms of raw performance. It was technically sharper and the frame rates a tad more consistent. And to make sure I felt the difference, I even switched back to the 3070 for a couple days to go back to the old performance and see if I felt like I missed this or the A6000. And, oh no, look at this here. Instead of getting a consistent 118 hertz, that's where I cap it, by the way, I'm getting 90 to 100 hertz in this game. Oh, here we go, and boom, look at that. I just saved myself $600 or $4,400. No, I didn't need the tie to get the same gaming experience, and the room was quieter, and it was cooler, and it ran just fine. And so what more is there really to say? I mean, I guess I tested Unreal Engine 5. I have a, a, a fully loaded version that was sent to me by a developer a month ago, and I do plan to use that for games testing moving forward. But, you know, no surprises. The 3080 Ti was 5% faster than the A6000 in that game. They both had the exact same experience. I think maybe the A6000, nah, there was no differences in smoothness, honestly. They're just both smoother than the 3070, as you would expect. And when it comes to mining, 
Yeah, the 3080 Ti has that Ethereum limit on it. It mines worse than the 3070 while using 350 watts, which maybe I could have tweaked it to try to find some middle ground to justify its LHR mining performance, you know, maybe undervolted. But, you know, the fact is that it seems pretty clear based on the limited testing I did that it's going to use half the hash rate at whatever power consumption it would normally have for double that. So... It's never going to be worth it, really, over using anything else, including an RDNA 2 card. Now, you can use other mining algorithms, but remember what I covered in that one video. NVIDIA is locking down the Ethereum mining heavily through a slight tweak to the board in silicon that goes through CUDA. So any algorithm that uses CUDA and its mining stack, NVIDIA can lock it down in the future. NVIDIA just does not treat you like an adult. Adults... Get 94 mega hash with the A6000. You're not an adult, apparently, if you have 3080 Ti. They don't want you to be able to do whatever you want with your graphics card, which we're starting to ramble a bit here, aren't we? In conclusion, it's a bit funny. I kind of feel let down by the 3080 Ti, uh, but I guess in hindsight, I'm not sure why I would have expected anything different. Hardware unboxed found GA102 cards to be very close to Navi21 cards, and RDNA2 is aging very well when you put in newer and newer games. I don't know why, maybe it's the price, maybe it's just the NVIDIA hype in their marketing, but I kind of was expecting or hoping for some other experience when it comes to the 3080 Ti, and I just didn't get any new experience I hadn't already had with the 6800 XT, and honestly, with the 3070, most games play just as well or as fun anyways. So, yeah, I mean, look, here's where we get to it. I'm not sure who this card is for. The 3070 made sense to me, as I said in my review. It has significantly lower energy than the GA102 cards, while having about two-thirds the performance, if not a little more than that. And yeah, it should have more VRAM, but if you're a creator, well, whatever. It's for you then, because of its abilities to do really well while editing and encoding and all these other tasks. And if you want more than a 3070 and you need more VRAM, well, then I guess either you'd probably get a 3090 and have a really good room for cooling it, right? Or you'd get an A-series card. Or you'd get an AMD card, right? See, I, see, I don't get it. If you're a creator on a budget, there's the 12 gigabyte 3060. That is fine. It's not great price performance, but it's... If you can get it near MSRP, it's okay, and it does give you 12 gigabytes. And if you want more than that, there's the 3070, but if you need more VRAM, you can probably afford an A card. The A4000's a grand, guys. The A5000's, honestly, about the price street price of a 3090 while using significantly less energy, and the A5000 is just 48 gigabytes. I don't know who the 3080 Ti is for. Who wants more VRAM, but then doesn't also want maybe 16 gigabytes for less money and is mostly a gamer. Because if you're not mostly a gamer, well then you're probably going to get an A-series card or have the money to get a 3090 with 24 gigabytes that will also heat up your room. I don't know who this is for. I, I think the 3080 Ti is basically an entirely pointless card. And on the other hand, the A6000 does not feel pointless. It's much more than I need or would ever justify spending for the tiny amount of extra performance I would get in my use cases, but it has 48 gigabytes of VRAM. It is incredibly premium. It has, you know, these, you know, NVLink connectors and a bunch of extra ports on it for specific use cases that a lot of people will pay up for. This isn't a useless card. It is a very cool card and it runs at about the same performance as a 3080 Ti while using at least 20% less energy while gaming and significantly less while doing anything else. And I do believe I'm forced to double down on it now. That's because it doesn't have horrible GDR6X. Something that I outlined was clearly a large part of the Ampere problem months ago. And by now, the evidence has just piled up. I mean, look at the 290 watt 3070 Ti that uses 33% more energy than the 220 watt 3070 for 10% more performance. Bringing basically the same level of performance as my overclocked 3070 while still using more energy than a 30 an overclocked 3070. Uh, GDR6X is stupid. Uh, there's no other way around it. It clearly ruins idle performance and it ruins any ability to conserve energy and 
I just can't help but think that NVIDIA, I don't know if they realized it too late or they just decided they don't care, but I just think it was a mistake to put on GA102. Look, I mean, the funny thing is that maybe it made sense to put GDR6X on the 3090 to have that ultra high-end Xbox Series X sized graphics card that keeps the crown or at least can claim it's keeping the crown by some metrics versus the AMD competition. But everything below that in the stack, I just don't think should have had GDR6X. I think NVIDIA missed a massive opportunity here where honestly, I think what NVIDIA could have done is had 24 gigabytes of GDR6X for the 3090, but then given you, remember GDR6 is cheaper than GDR6X, 24 gigabytes of GDR6 for the 3080 Ti, and that would have looked eh, pretty cool next to the 6900 XT. You'd have said, eh, it's 200 bucks more on paper, but it's also giving you 50% more RAM than the 6900 XT. And you know what? It's about the same performance and it would probably have used the same amount of energy as far as we can tell by looking at this thing, right? So they could have then made the 3080 full 12 gigabytes, normal GDR6 as well. And I honestly think if the 3080 had normal GDR6, that it probably would have used about 250 watts and been more efficient than the 6800 XT, while well, again, having the same performance. There's just no way around it. In my opinion, NVIDIA took one look at what was going on with RDNA 2 behind the scenes, and they said, we cannot let them win. We have to keep the crown. And if we do this, if we push these cards extra hard, AMD will be behind us by at least 10%. But then AMD wasn't behind them by at least 10%, and they just looked silly. Ampere really is not deep down an inefficient architecture. It's actually kind of impressive. NVIDIA is using a pretty notably inferior node to the TSMC 7 nanometer on RDNA 2 while getting as good, if not slightly better efficiency in some of their products, products that don't use GDR6X. They could have still kept the 3090 as some stupid overpriced 350, 400 watt card, but the rest of their lineup, like the 3080, like the 3070 Ti, with a different configuration devoid of GDR6X, could have been something that maybe doesn't win the performance crown. Maybe the 3080 wouldn't have won in 4K against the 6800 XT. But it could have used less energy and required cheaper coolers, been more competitive in price performance and efficiency. And I think that just long-term would have been less dumb, especially when you consider that they were forced to weirdly segment it down to 10 gigabytes of GDR6X and... That's going to hurt its performance big time in the long run. It's funny, Ampere kind of reminds me as a better Vega, but a Vega that instead of having HBM put on it, was saddled with GDR6X. And so, yeah, I like some Ampere graphics cards. I like the 3070, although it should have 16 gigabytes. I like A6000. I might even try to get my hands on an A4000 to really see if its performance is around a 3070 while using so little energy. But otherwise, though... I'm going to say it. In conclusion, if you are a gamer looking to ball out, honestly, get the 6800 XT for around MSRP. They're popping up in stock on AMD's website. And if you're a creator, the 3080 Ti occupies a no man's land. You would want to get a budget creator card then, the 3060 12 gigabyte, or if you don't need the VRAM, the 3070, or if you have the money and don't care, the 3090, or an A5000 or A6000. But... The 3080 Ti is simply for no one. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this video. It was quite a lot of exhaustive work. Remember, if you did, to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Moore's Law is Dead. Ring the bell button so you don't miss upcoming videos. Like it, and of course, share this video to other people. Hopefully, other people would also enjoy a different take on doing GPU reviews. And then also remember that, you know, paying for having this thing to be shipped out and shipped back and the time to do this work, it is a lot of work, and the patrons are what keep us going. Me, Dan, Gerard the entire Moore's Law is Dead team. So if you have the extra money to give us like an extra cup of coffee a month, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We'll get early ad-free access to content and exclusive content that no one else gets. And then as always, thank you for watching.